We have a tremendous speaker for you all tonight. Um, Rob is an incredibly well-spoken, accomplished entrepreneur, and he has so many life lessons and accomplishments to tell you guys all about today. Call you an intro. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Glad to have you. Good to be here. All right, so typically we kind of start these things off and, and do them somewhat chronologically. Uh, so I guess we'll start first from a, from a bit of a younger age. Uh, if you want to talk about where you grew up, what your family did, maybe if there was some sort of entrepreneurial spark or anything like that from a young age. Yeah. Go ahead. Never before in anyone these things been asked about my childhood, but that's great. My, my parents are far more interesting than I am, uh, and I wish they could be here. They're, they're both alive, though, and they're doing well. <laughs> if this is being taken, maybe I'll send it to them. But yeah, my parents are both extraordinary. You know, and like I said before, I think my story would be a lot more interesting if they weren't so extraordinary. I mean, I think I was just created for success. I think my story would be a lot more interesting if I had had failed more in life. Uh, I had two most just loving parents in the world. And my mother was a, a saluted victorian, is that the right word, at Cornell in the Ivy League school when uh, not a lot of women were going to the school. My father, you know, Harvard Law School, and, really accomplished lawyer really had Watergate clients. But more importantly than anything, they just smothered me with love my whole life. But kind of fast forwarding a little bit, when I went to, I went to University of Chicago Law School, right, a really good law school, and my father was really proud of me, and uh, you know, I was somewhat following his footsteps. And he raised me to think that being a lawyer teaches you how to speak, think, and write, and you don't actually have to practice law. I knew I was never gonna practice law, but he taught me some mentality. Um, so I, and I knew that growing up, and that's really why I went to law school. <laughs> I'm going to digress for a second, but I had that moment that I'm sure all of you have had here at SC, right? It was the beginning of my first year of law school. I was the night before an exam, and I knew nothing on that exam. And I had that freak out moment. I'm going to flunk. My life is over. I'm going to get kicked out of law school. I'm going to go back and work in a local you know, gas station. So it's one of those moments where I do, I revert to age six, and I call my dad. And, um, and when typically parents or friends are going to tell you in that situation, calm down. You're worrying too much. You'll do fine. Right, but, uh, but they don't really know, because maybe you know nothing on that exam. My father's tactic I thought was brilliant. You know, when I told him maybe I'm gonna flunk out of law school, his response was, so what? So what if you do? Maybe you're not meant to be a lawyer. But the theme of my childhood from that is they told me my father loved me no matter what. My parents just smothered me with love. They didn't care if I flunked out of law school. And I think that's what was giving me the entrepreneurial drive throughout life. I've always known that I can run back to my parents with my tail between my legs and everything, everything will be good. And, then, and the story went well. I went on and I made law review and I calmed down. I thought, you know, if I was right, the law school went well. That's what I was going to say. You seemed hesitant, but at the same time ended up going into the corporate world and practicing law <coughs> for a bit. Um, given your hesitancy, that was something that you still wanted to do. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good question, Mike. I mean, can the guys I sold out, you know, when you're, you're at a top law school and they throw so much money at you, right, and, uh, you know, they wine you and dine you and you come out to... Uh, so I just, I sold out. I knew I wasn't going to be a practicing lawyer. And at the moment, I thought, look, if I'm, you know, I, I knew my future was in business, and I figured it can't hurt to learn a little bit about corporate law, and I was doing mergers and acquisitions work at a big law firm. Actually, Dave Belasco, who uh, I've heard reference, and Dave texted me last night, so he and I were at the same law firm back in those days, you know, 25 years ago, whatever that was. Um, so, yeah, in essence, essentially, I sold out, but as soon as I was there, I knew... I mean, I think if I look at the 20 of the 20 of us that started in our first year at Latham, maybe one still there, and most have gone into business. It's like a lot of people end up, I know I'm not speaking to law students, but a lot of people end up going to law school because they enjoy thinking, speaking, and writing, or they like LA Law or LA McBeal or something, right? But to be, to be happy as a lawyer, you have to be happy as a technician. And so the more well-rounded people generally aren't happy as lawyers. So most of them end up going out and finding paths out. out. So, so was there a specific moment at which you were like, I I'm done with this, I need to move on? Yeah, yeah, it's about three and a half years in where I just hated what I was doing. And I had looked ahead at the partners that were you know, you know, decades older than me. And when you look at them, you know you don't want their lives. That was a sign to me that you know, you just you got to get out. And, uh, but I was unsuccessful in looking for other jobs. I just wanted a job in business. And anybody would hire me as a lawyer because I had the pedigree and and, and the you know, experience at Latham, so I could get offered all these jobs as lawyers, but I failed in all my attempts at finding that business job, and thank God I failed. Because, yeah, the breakthrough moment for me was when um, all of a sudden one morning, you know, I suppose if there's an entrepreneurial lesson here, right, it's just think big. I think too often we think in kind of 
uh, limited, um, constrained ways about our future. And I wasn't quite thinking big enough. My number one passion throughout life had been sports. And one day I just woke up with this vision of being a sports agent. And, it, and I told all my friends about it. Uh, I think maybe probably even Dave, uh, Dave Velasco. And they all laughed, right? Because I was the same guy that got turned down for all the other business jobs I was going for. And now I just picked a profession where there's maybe four people hired a year out of 10,000 applicants. So it was, um, but everything just went my way, right? And I just, and as soon as I thought big and thought, you know, a sports agent, and then the issue is how do you do it? And then I just networked. I just, I called up, you know, everybody I knew and found out, does anybody know anybody at any teams? I just did all the networking I could. If anybody was a, had been a donor at a school, then I, maybe I could meet the AD, the athletic director at those schools. So I just did a ton of networking. I played baseball and hockey my whole life. And so I just did, I did networking at every level. And then I got granted a 20 minute informational interview with David Falk. So David Falk is, if you look up in Wikipedia sports agent, I think his face appears. He's the legendary sports agent. And so I was granted 20 minutes in front of him but I never shut up. So that 20 minutes just turned into two, three hours. I think in total went two and a half hours. He just kept me there the whole time. And I came in pitching, you know, because he was the king of basketball and football, which are my two passions. But I figured I got no value out there. So I came in pitching baseball and hockey. And um, but then a week later, he called me up. He liked my plan so much. He said, I know you came in passionate about baseball and hockey, but I got to thinking the guy running basketball isn't working out. Do you want that job? And which was like the dream come true. And then my second day of work, I'm introduced to Michael Jordan. And David didn't really know if I was smart. But he assumed I was just on paper, like everybody will, will think about you guys coming out of here. On paper, I looked a lot smarter than a typical sports agent. I was law review at the University of Chicago and, and the Latham and Watkins. There aren't a lot of sports agents with that kind of pedigree. So he introduced me to Michael Jordan as the smartest guy he ever hired. And then all of a sudden, Michael trusted me. And then I got known around the NBA as Michael's boy. And, and so it's just kind of, it just it's wild. But remember guys, I was the same guy that six weeks earlier could not get hired at a normal business job. And then, you know, everything just changed really overnight when, you know, I just took advantage of that 20 minute informational interview, didn't shut up and, and, um, and that was, yeah, that was the big turning point. Okay, so you worked with a ton of these different sort of mega stars, right? Any notable stories like traveling around with MJ? Um, I, I don't know. Like, Look, I adore MJ, and, and candidly, I'm a lot closer to his family today than I am to him. I haven't seen him in, I think, three or four years. I talk to his mother and sister all the time, so I adore his mother and sister. I love Michael, too, right? but, um, you know, but Michael's a very kind of shy, inward guy, so I don't know that there's really, I, you know, I mean, I would fly out. It was really cool for me, because I was like 27, 28 at the time, and I would fly across the country with him to meet Phil Knight. You guys know who that is? That's the yeah, founder of Knight. So, you know, I fly out with Michael, we meet with Phil Knight. So lots of fun like stuff like that happens. Sure. This is the mid nineties, this is like the be like Mike Glory days. It, it was yeah, it was extraordinary. You know, the timing, I just lucked out on the timing. <coughs> and and um, so yeah, it was you know, that part was just awesome. And then that's really where spurred what spurred my passion for marketing. So I spent much more time look, representing the players in terms of sports contracts is just brain dead simple. It's just really, really easy. You just end up spending a half of 1% of your time doing that. So, um, and the marketing really is, is typically not too challenging unless it's a, a Michael Jordan or a LeBron James or something. There aren't many of those guys because with most athletes, you're looking for used car deals. It's nothing, it's nothing that interesting from a marketing perspective. So it was really an extraordinary opportunity, obviously, for me to be uh, you know, working with Michael and I got to do kind of cutting edge marketing stuff. But I also knew quickly I wanted to get out of that. It was, you know, Michael had just retired, and um, and so that's when I, I knew my passion was to, to be a P&L guy, and I wanted to run businesses. So that gave me, the sports agency gave me the kind of the, the platform to be able to do that. So at what point did you sort of take the cue to transition elsewhere, and how did the opportunity with Champion come about? Uh, and by the way, I never answered your question. Yeah, there was fun stuff. I mentioned, I mentioned the Biden over months. And I took, I, we, I took Patrick Ewing around the world once on a, a round the world trip. We stopped in every continent. And this is relevant to your next question, too. So I'll segue into that. But yeah, the idea was that what I figured out early on in my sports career is these athletes were really powerful catalysts for igniting the local trendsetters. So my passion, even back then, was all about the, the small trendsetters, not the big celebrities. But I used the celebrities to mobilize the local trendsetters, right? So if I took Patrick into different markets, 
and I knew I could attract the, the local trendsetters. I put shoes on their feet, and I could make the brand cool, right? So that's what really kind of where the influence of marketing was kind of born in my brain about 15 years before the industry actually existed, right? And about five years before a key, a key book that impacted me, Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, that I was, you know, heavily impacted by that. And so that's really where the passion from influential marketing came. But Max, to answer your question on Champion, yeah, so Champion had, from doing that with Patrick, the same company that owned Patrick's company also owned Champion Footwear. And again, I was a guy gunning for P&L, you know, responsibility, and they gave me the shot. So they, you know, they hired me to come in and run the international division. <coughs> so having the experience in sports allowed, allowed me to transition out, and that was a blast. Sure. Yeah. So while there, you were able to drive a lot of growth in sales without very much of a budget. And given that there are other sort of student entrepreneurs in the room, and growing a brand without having very much money is a struggle that they are all, I'm sure, very, very familiar with. Um, can you maybe talk about some of the tactics or strategies, as well as some of the challenges mm -hmm. to growing champion while you were there? Yeah. Yeah, another good question. Yeah, that is really challenging, right? It's challenging. And kind of cutting to the chase today, we've got a technology product we're marketing today. And thankfully, it's in an area where there's a lot of, a lot, I'll come back and answer your question, but it's an area where the value can be stated very succinctly in an email. And so we don't have to market, right? So it's just, our marketing costs are virtually nothing. So you can find those products, right? If you've really tapped into the need and you can articulate the need concisely where you, not a lot of marketing is needed. It's, it's rare that that happens, though. So, but back then with Champion, yeah, it's like, like I said, I was heavily impacted by Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point. And my first, uh, my first kind of pilot was I put shoes on all the cool kids in Sao Paulo, Brazil, but not in Rio. And for me, the ROI I cared about was sales. I didn't care about anything else. I didn't care about impressions. And I saw a sales spike in Sao Paulo that I didn't see in, in Rio, right? And so that's, and then I knew this influential marketing worked. And again, this is back in the early days. There's nothing digital about this. This is getting shoes on cool kids. And I did it through nightclub promoters. I figured, you know, the light bulb in my head was nightclub promoters are tied into all the cool kids in these local markets. They're not paid that much, so I can buy them pretty cheaply to kind of spread the word in these local markets. And so, actually, nightclub promoters ended up being kind of a linchpin of a lot of my marketing strategies for the next kind of 15 years after that. But it really started back in those champion days. Sure. Um, and so then at what point did you sort of get the urge to, urge to do your own thing, or was there something about Champion that was sort of, you know, in the long term kind of drove you away from the brand? Is there a reason that you didn't, you know, sort of say that? Yeah, no, it actually happened while at Champion. So while at Champion, there were, I had the opportunity to spin the license. So Champion was a licensee at Sara Lee. Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's tied to Sara Lee anymore. I think it's a completely independent company. But back then, we were a licensee at Sara Lee. And then um, and they didn't care about the international territory. So I saw the opportunity while I was there to, to spin off the international division. So that, you know, that's where it happened. Maybe for some of you, you'll come up with some idea and then you'll follow through on that idea and then it'll unfold exactly as you imagine. But that's, that's not typical. You know, far more, far more typical is just to get involved in something you like. It can be a normal corporate job, but once you're in it, you dive into it and you see a weakness or you see an opportunity. For me, you know, I just saw an opportunity. I don't think I ever really thought of being an entrepreneur until I was there, and I saw that I had an opportunity to form this company, attack these international markets that nobody else was going to attack. And then from there, I never looked back. It's been entrepreneurial ever since then. Right. Okay. And so the so the first venture was 2005 or so. Was that is that correct? Or? No, it was uh, it was that was probably around 2000 when I spun Champion off, and then uh, I think what you're referencing then then Xeni after that. Yeah. So. Um, so then we ended up selling, the, the license terminated at some point. And so look, that was a nice little win. I did well with Champion, but it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, you know, it wasn't the, the be all and end all, right? And, uh, but I, it ignited my passion for the influencer space, and I had seen how influencer strategies work <coughs> with my brand, Champion, where all I cared about were sales, and I saw that it drove sales. So my vision back then, to still my vision today, was, uh, you know, I, I looked at it from a sports perspective. If you're if you're Coca-Cola and you want to reach the global basketball fan, you do a deal with the NBA and LeBron James, and you're going to reach the global basketball fan. But for me, I thought that the real big upside was to mobilize all those small trendsetters. I wanted to be the NFL and the NBA of local trendsetters, if that makes sense. If I could somehow create an organization that would have all those local cool kids around the world be able to access them. So the way I went about it in 2005 was through an event platform. 
So I figured if I've got the coolest events in metropolitan markets that are attracting all the trendsetters, I've got a global influencer platform, right? We do that in markets around the world. That was the idea. Um, and the idea was good, and it launched here in LA way bigger than I could have imagined. That, uh, you know, didn't. So in LA, because I knew we had to be cool, and so I just came up with this idea once late at night. Well, what if I actually did the party starting at 1 a.m.? So the whole point is you got to differentiate yourself, right? So I didn't want to do a typical party. So, right, in a city like L.A. where the bars close at 2, I'm like, all right, let's do these parties from 1 to 4 a.m. And that was the event. The whole city just grabbed onto that. And we became this celebrity darling, right? In the very first launch event, we had Jessica Alba and Paris and Nikki back when they were something, and Kim Kardashian and Leo DiCaprio. I mean, all in one event, right? And, and every week, and Lindsay Lohan, we couldn't keep out of there, even though she was underage. <laughs> right? but, uh, it, was, uh, it became like a celebrity darling. So again, same thing as earlier in my sports days, I was using the major celebrities to attract the trendsetters. And so we got all this global attention. Um, and, and this part of my career sounds fun, but it was, honestly guys, it was the worst part of my career. I, I, I hated it. Because it wasn't, the idea of an event, the problem with an event platform in the influencer space is you're limited by the number of people you can fit into a box. Right, you've got these venues, and even if I'm doing these boxes or venues around the country or world, you're still limited. It's really not scalable, but God, the universe, whatever you believe in, right, in the middle of this gave me my gift, which has changed my life. And you know, also in the middle of doing this Xeni experiment, from like 2005 to 2008, is when kind of digital marketing kind of started to emerge, right? Now you got influencers who press buttons on a phone and they can hit millions. So that's really it was kind of the, the game that you just happened to happen. It happened. I couldn't have predicted it, right? I had a passion for influencer marketing before that. Um, and then I came up with the idea for Zomat. And, um, and so, and this happened, so Xeni was, Xeni sounds really sexy, and it was fun for most people, but the problem was I had to wake up, you know, it's, you're doing events. You're doing events on a weekly basis. And uh, you know, I remember having to wake up every Saturday, Sunday morning thinking, I gotta do this shit all over again next week, and I gotta be cooler than I was last week to this Hollywood ADD crowd. Right, and it was just, but it, yeah, I mean, every week it was, you know, it was Steve A. Eric Irioki or, or Samantha Ronson, or you know, we had all the top DJs there, and it was, you know, it was a, it was a celebrity love fest, but it, it wasn't a tremendous business, business model. We grossed, I think, seven million dollars, but the events were so expensive, there wasn't a lot of, it just was something that could never become, you know, a hundred, two hundred million dollar company. So, two more questions before we move on to Zomat. First off, when you got started, how did you get the word out about it? And second, talk about the inspiration for the name. <coughs> All right, fair enough. Good questions. Um, uh, so on, on, on the first, the how to get the word out. Again, it comes back to that whole nightclub promoter thing, right? So I used nightclub promoters back in my sports agent days and in my champion days. And so it was really about just uh, getting the word out among the nightclub promoters. But you know, to my earlier point, I'm saying as long as you can, you can, you can articulate the value really concisely, and people just instantly got it, wow. Because the idea behind Xeni was, I, didn't, I don't think I explained this, we moved the venue every week, so it was never in the same place. So the idea, it was constantly moving, right? I realized with your generation, or even your generation 10 years ago, uh, y'all get, you know, if things get stale really quickly, so we had to keep it fresh. So I didn't want to do anything like a nightclub in one venue. The idea was that party locations would change every week, so we would do them until one, four in the morning, Generally, we were running out sound stages, but just doing that is gonna attract the people. And the fact that we were able to nail the celebrities <coughs> at that first event, were just travels automatically. But you know, nightclub promoters were a good facilitator for that. Um, and as for the name, um, my middle name is Xavier, all right? I'm Robert Xavier Perry III, so I've always loved the letter X. I love my father, as you can tell. And, um, and so I've started all these companies with the letter X, and Xeni and Zomad. Um, Xeni, Actually, so I started looking up, I wanted a made up name, and I still believe in that today. So for any of you entrepreneurs, uh, thinking of a name for your next company, I highly encourage you to not make it about whatever you think the company will be about, because whatever you think that company will be about, it's likely to change, right? It, and, um, and so I wanted a, a name that would be flexible enough to grow however the company grew, right? And so uh, Xenia a, is a Latin word I looked up in a Latin dictionary, and it means a gift from a host to a guest. Right. Yeah, host to a guest. It's been a while since I'm focused on that. So it was just a made-up name I found in a Latin dictionary. I like the fact it was hard to pronounce, hard to spell, 
Because in that kind of world where you're doing these high-end events, it's the idea, you know, so if you go to your top nightclub, you're never going to see a name out front, right? The whole idea is nobody knows what's behind that door. So there was a little mystery behind the name. But so were, you, were you reading a Latin dictionary, or how did you... <laughs> yeah, I think I was just trying to come up with a, a word, a, a name that began with the letter X. And yeah, I think I looked at the Latin dictionary, I looked at the letter X, and I came, up, I came up with it, yeah. All right, and so then you made the zone map, the next X. Yeah. Um, and so you, had, you sort of had this idea at the time what did the space of influencer marketing look like, and what was your sort of high-level vision for what Soundmap could become? Yeah, at the time, influencer marketing was completely non-existent, at least digital influencer marketing, right? I, as I said, I've already, I had already been engaging in influencer marketing for years, but, but uh, influencer marketing has been around for decades, if you want to count celebrities or, or brand ambassadors. A lot of brands 10, 20 years ago, just they would get brand ambassadors to spread the word. People would go put like signs up on street corners, right? So, uh, you know, if you think about A&R guys used to do that in music. But digital influential marketing hadn't existed yet. And, uh, you know, I speak at conferences around the world. Uh, I spoke at one last week. And I say, uh, we say all the time, we're the oldest influential marketing company in the world. Nobody's ever disputed that, so we think it's true. So, yeah, the, the industry was completely non-existent. And I got to tell you, those early years, it was tough, man. It was CMOs, mostly CMOs, they're old guys like me, right? And they're just and they've been raised on television or the way marketing has traditionally been done. And it was hard to get them to see the value here. They were still in love with their TV and print strategies. And it took probably, those first couple of years were really tough. It took like uh, probably three, four years before influencer marketing overall caught on. Uh, and look, influencer marketing still is in its very infancy right now. It is just, we're in a really embryonic stage. It's barely started. Right, but it really kind of 2013, 2014 was when the marketing executives started to see the value of it. Sure. So I guess on on the consumer end, right? As a, a lot of us are college students, um, that's something that is seems a little odd. The, the the fact that it's nascent because we see a lot of our friends uh, basically posting on social media for brands, uh, and, and so people consider themselves influencers because they get paid <coughs> to write a script. A yeah, scripted yeah. thing on Instagram, right? Yeah. And so, uh, when we were sort of talking to our friends about this event, someone brought up with us, you know, it's a very saturated space. Is it something that's dying? Uh, and so, I guess my question for you is, how? Well, first off, what is your take on that? Uh, how is influencer marketing changing, and what is Zomad doing to sort of stay at the forefront of yeah. that change? Oh, great questions. I can answer that for two hours. Yeah. But I'll try to do <laughs> and yeah, when I, we had lunch with Lada two weeks ago. She had asked me if she thought if, if, if influencer marketing was dying. And in fact, I, uh, you know, I, I spoke last week, so Zomad got hired last week to teach all of the Clorox brands. So Clorox is a big holding company. They own everything from Burt's Bees to Brita Water to all the cleaning brands to Glad to Kingsford Charcoal, a ton of brands across the consumer space. And we were, I was, it was really honored, and maybe one of our company's biggest honors that we were taught not to present to them about Zomad, but to teach them about influencer marketing. But I at some point told them about Lydon's question, and the whole room like just laughed, right? And, and it's not coming from a bad place. It's coming from a place where she knows, as a lot of you do, that there's authenticity lacking. You know, when you see those Instagram posts from your friends, you guys were telling me about Juliet, right? And Juliet was kind of laughing that she got made <laughs> the post for Uggs, right? And so, however, wherever that campaign came from within Uggs, that was done without a regard for authenticity. And that's the number one problem in the influencer space. So I, 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 you know, everything like if, for example, she had posted before about Uggs, if she had a history on her, I don't know anything about your channel, but <laughs> if she had a channel about posting for Uggs and she had known for it, then it might look authentic, right? And then she could talk about that. I've been a long time lover, and then it might mean a little bit more. Or if maybe she had posted at an event, if she had gone to an event and involved Uggs, then that might be cool, and you guys might see that, and then you love Juliet, and in fact, she's at an event that seems real, so there's other ways to do it. And we're big as a company on events and gatherings, but authentic events and authentic gatherings, and like for, like a, we have a lot of our Zomad team here, and a bunch of them were there at the Korox conference last week, and that word authenticity probably got mentioned over 100 times. It's so overused, but it is, it's the theme of where the influencer space is today. These campaigns have to be constructed in a way that this Uggs campaign, no offense to Uggs, was not done, right? It's got to be about 
you know, people that authentically like the product, and, and it's got to be done in a context that the uh, the consumers are going to like, right? Something they're going to want to engage with. So that's why we're big on kind of when events make sense too. Events or small influencer gatherings. Sure. But so. we're like. But we're so into authenticity. We're the only influencer company in the world that has integrated influencer strategies into the entire product development cycle. Um, so in other words, what we do is um, we've got, we've been, like over the last year, we've had products that range. So brands will come to us and they'll want to use influencers to look into the future, right? So you know, a brand will want to know what's the trends going to be like with 20 to 24 year olds um, three to five years from now. And influencers are way better than consumers at trying to predict those trends. And we've got, other, we've got other projects where influencers are used to ideate around potential product concepts. So um, we, may, we do a lot of this work for L'Oreal in the beauty space. So L'Oreal may have somebody somewhere within L'Oreal, this mass conglomerate, will have this general idea about a product. It could be something absolutely insane, like a, you wear an umbrella and the makeup seeps down on your face, right? Or something crazy. And we'll send these paragraphs off to influencers and allow them to ideate. And the really creative influencers will come back with great ideas. So we still believe in, and, and then when that prototype is made, we use the influencers to test the prototype and give feedback. And when it gets further along, so you know, we love it when we can involve influencers from the beginning to the end, and not just paying them to post. So they authentically are tied into the whole history behind the product. So yeah, everything we do is is holding authenticity in the in the absolute, in the absolute highest regard. So, okay. That so along those lines then, how do you, I guess, source influencers to work with? How do you find the people who are the trendsetters? You, yeah. When we got lunch, you explained to me that influencers really just are the most influential consumers, but in themselves are consumers, right? So how do you find the consumers that predict where trends are going? Yeah, so look, a lot of influencers, most of them suck, right? Most of them, you know, when, when money started pouring into the influencer field, you had a lot of people that made themselves into influencers and they, uh, a lot of them would buy followers, right? So you've got a lot of fake influencers out there. You've got a lot of people that really shouldn't be influencers. So the most important quality of an influencer company is to make sure you're vetting the right kind of influencers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, we're here, like, you know, Danny, raise your hand, Danny. Danny is the head of our whole tech team. So she has, I think, 33 people that report to her, and she's creating a variety of different tech products. But one of the products she's created that we love from an agency perspective is she will, uh, she got, she, her technology will map influencers based on their historical ability to set trends. So think about it. If you're an influencer, the great thing about social media is it documents your history. So if you're a beauty influencer, and I can look at the top three or four beauty trends of the last couple of years within your niche, right, you better have posted ahead of time about those trends. Does that make sense, guys? Yeah. Right, so some trend happened, right, and, um, and so, what we do is we look at influencers and we'll, we'll use this technology to make sure they truly were trendsetters or early adopters, right? So if we can look at a hashtag, you know, kind of script out, if I had a diagram, I'd script it out for you. But when we can look how a hashtag for a certain beauty trend exploded, we want to see an influencer or a real trendsetter posting right at the beginning, before it got big or helped to make it big. Did you? Do you only use the hashtag to, not, to see if that's, if they're, original influencer or do you use other things? Because I see in our era, we don't really use hashtags anymore. Yeah, you can use keywords. You know, hashtag, hashtags are still you know, pretty prevalent. We use keywords, or we can, and Danny can answer this even better than me. Well, you can also use machine learning. So if there's, say that trend, and we're getting better and better every day at machine learning. So if it's a beauty trend that's visible by the picture, then, then hopefully the, the machines can pick up on that trend so we don't even need a word to pick up on it. Danny, how'd I do? Is that a good answer? Close enough. It's actually primarily uh, due to the limitation of the platform itself, the social media platform, but in this case, Instagram, for example. But how we started is using hashtags, but we branch out. So we're looking into the keyword level. Uh, we develop a platform right now trying to predict the next trend. So for the prediction side, we, we actually looking at the keyword and the photo images level as well. By the way, you guys still are using a lot of hashtags, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but so on the on the note of that platform, where do you sort of see that going? Like, are there additional features you'd like to add, or is it just about the platform over time becoming more accurate? Of that, of that. To trend. predict trends, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So um, 
Yeah, that gets right to the heart of our business plan. So we got, we're got we really, really excited about our business plan. And Danny and I have been working really closely together the last couple of weeks on creating. You always have to have a plan, right? That plan's always changing. But we're at a really, really good place right now, knock on wood. Look, as an entrepreneur, some days you know I feel like I'm on the, the edge of conquering the world, and other days I'm on the verge of bankruptcy, right? You've got those opposite feelings that happen all the time. Right now, lately, it's been the better of those, right? It feels really, really good. You know, and a lot of being entrepreneurs just luck. We just happen to be in a great space right now. Our strategies have always been about authenticity, and the whole consumer product world is all about authenticity right now. So right now, we're in the midst of creating this this big business plan that a lot of it does revolve around this this trend technology. So we actually envision even creating a trend portal that um, ends up you know that brands would would sign into and pay a lot of money to understand where the, the trends are going in different niches and verticals around the country. So that's just, that's just one component of our business plan. Sure. Uh, and, and, and candidly, the, this technology I'm talking about is not even a really big part of like, like Catherine, raise your hand, Catherine. Catherine is a recent SC grad. She graduated last mm -hmm. uh, December, right? Here, Marshall, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and so most of the vetting she does really has nothing to do with that technology, too. Uh -huh. So I don't want to overstate the, the yeah, impact sure, of that. Sure. But it's something we're really excited about. And, and again, because everything, because we'll, we'll, what we are, to, however we're vetting influencers, you know, how we're attempting to do them is just to make sure that we're really finding the truly influential influencers. And look, we're not perfect at it. Yeah, at the end of each campaign, there'll be like 10% of influencers. <coughs> like, Why the fuck did we hire them, right? They're like, it didn't, you know, they just didn't end up, um, they looked like maybe they had fake followers. So I, I think we're better at it than everybody in the industry, but it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a weird science. It's not, it's not bulletproof. So the tech platform came out when, 2017? Well, no, our whole, so we built, uh, so we, yeah, so we put a lot of money into building this technology yeah. platform over the last few years. This trend part we've been talking about is just a tiny part of that. But the broader, so the yeah. broader platform. So what it does, if you're like with Juliet, right? We can take her, and you know, with her, you have what three thousand followers, or something? something like that. Okay. So a brand would want to know, others would want to know, who are those three thousand followers, right? We want to make sure that that's the target base, right? Mm -hmm. So the, a brand may come to us and say, we're trying to reach twenty-four to twenty-eight-year-old fitness-oriented women. So then, if we're vetting influencers around the world. We want to make sure that those influencers have a lot of followers in that 24 to 28 year old fitness oriented category, right? So we need to know about the followers. So the key to the technology is to know everything possible about her 6,000 followers, right? And then if, in going a little bit deeper, we also want to look well, where's her engagement coming from, right? If her engagement is coming from 14 year olds and they're trying to reach 20 to 24 year olds or 24 to 28 year olds, that's not good. So there's a lot of different components of this, of kind of the vetting processes, but it, it really, you know, but this, the technology that Danny's team has developed, um, and she can speak much better about this if you want to chime in about this. But it, it, well, the up? Sure. But the technology that, sure. that she has, has developed, you know, first and foremost, it needs to tell us everything possible about the influencer's followers. Okay. And that's what the brand, so the brand world today has gotten uh, you guys heard of programmatic? You know what that is? So programmatic is a, um, it's, it's a, I mean, the whole idea is they want to know everything possible about you, right? So brands want to know exactly who you are, and they're doing all their digital buys based on, 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 on who you are statistically. So if you're a guy and you visit ESPN, uh, the sports page, right, that's going to tell them something, and they're going to, you know, you, know, you guys know the whole story. They follow your paths along you across the internet trying to figure out who you are. So all that happens in digital marketing. And, but the problem with digital marketing is most of you guys have ad blockers or you're ignoring the ads, right? And so I, you know, so, you know, but Lida and Max had asked me different questions and, and implicit within the question a couple of questions ago was, does influential marketing work? And, and you know, my answer is, if you think about, you know, I asked Max, well, what does work? Because you're not, you know, TV doesn't work for you, print doesn't work, radio doesn't work, and digital buy, digital media doesn't work, right? I mean, the use of ad blockers and buy. So an influencer campaign, if done well, works better than anything else there. And, and the brands realize that. The, the huge caveat is you gotta do it right. And you gotta do it, it it's around authenticity and the future of influencer marketing, I can't remember your question if I'm answering. But the future of influencer <laughs> marketing, in my opinion, is about doing very large numbers of smaller influencers. So I think Juliet's great, right? Because that's 
because you all are going to see her as not a hired gun. You're all laughing because of her odds post, right? So you don't see that as authentic. <laughs> She's laughing, right? <laughs> right? But, but still, but she knows a lot of those 3,000 followers. And she's seen, you know, a 14-year-old knows that Kendall Jenner was paid to do that post, right? And, um, right? and so, and, and so and Kendall's not going to be seen as authentic. But if Juliet could have been used in that campaign in a way that makes her, you know, or brown her authenticity or what she actually likes, that, that's the future of influencer marketing. So it's using very, very large numbers. So typical campaign will have thousands of Juliets or maybe tens of thousands. So that, to me, is the future of influencer campaigns. Very, very large numbers of smaller influencers. So I think you're going to see a lot of more events come back into it. Because if we did a really cool UGS event tonight, I'll bet I could get you guys all there. You know, and, and so you have to do the right kind of event. And something like that might might actually work. Does that make sense? Can you say that quote one more time? Because I'm going to quote you on this. That's Wait, which quote? The, um, the future of influencer marketing is a bunch of small... Like, yes, yeah, about like, aggregating very large numbers of very small influencers. So you know, the micro-influencers have become the rage over the last couple of years. Um, we've been on that forever. But micro-influencers are generally defined as influencers with 20,000 reach to 100,000. So I think the future is more of a lot more like the Juliet's, but in very large numbers. Mm -hmm. So I actually applaud uh, for, that, for that part of it. Because I'll bet they're, I'll bet they're doing her in thousands of her. Right? And so, Actually, yeah. our machine telling us that. So we have the, we build the entire system to monitor and find you, actually, or people even smaller than you. And we have seen <coughs> that Brian actually started paying for a much smaller uh, influencer now to share about their products. And they just, there's actually, there's one of brand I, I can't really say, but we keep saying, we keep saying, like, everyone, every single micro that from 1,000 to 3,000, had worked with that brand. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yes, definitely that's, that, uh, that trend is definitely it. Start growing really quickly. And this is what Rob is saying, that we just, you know, coming definitely working health benefit right now. We've seen on both sides, from, especially from the brand, even though the company had been reaching about this micro influencer for a long time, but now we start seeing more and more company now has embraced that concept and see that, and you can see that one of Julia's they found her somehow. But we have a machine. We'll probably find you somewhere. I'm going to go home and check and see if we found you. <laughs> <laughs> but if she had posted about, if it had been something about her life, like say a restaurant reached out to her because she had posted at that restaurant, then she posted at that restaurant. Or maybe they somehow encouraged her to come back there. Right? That's authentic. And then if she's posting from there on Instagram, that might impact you. That might want to make you try out the restaurant. Because you like Juliet, you trust that she's being real about this, right? She's posted there before. She genuinely likes the restaurant. So there's all kinds of ways, tremendous ways to do really powerful influencer campaigns. But the future is, yeah, like I said, very, very large numbers of much, of much smaller influencers. Yeah, so along the lines of the tech platform, I, something that just came to mind I was kind of curious about. So say you, you're looking at a, an influencer's sort of like follower base, right? Uh, and a lot of those followers are private, right? To, to what extent are you able to actually then get demographic information about the, the follower base of that person? Yeah, uh, for that, to be honest, I mean, if an account is a private account, you can't really get into that information. Right. We haven't really seen such a big percentage, though, that it would impact our analysis of the audience demographic. Are most but accounts public? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, most of the follower accounts are actually public. Um, we still see that trend. Not among you guys, though. Yeah. Among you, yeah. But um, yeah, so in general, we it's statistical enough, uh, significant enough for us to still be able to do our analytics um, so far. But that's, it's a great question. We haven't seen that much of the yeah. even though with all the talk like that, you'd be surprised how the actual data are gonna tell you. I mean, we work day, every day making hypotheses every day, and when we really look at the data, it's completely different. Different yeah, but Max, that, that really is a very sophisticated question. Most of our, our clients don't even know to ask that question. So it really, there's really problems. Like the, you know, the, the technology is not foolproof in being able to identify audiences. Um, it's not going to be nearly as accurate, for example, correct me if I'm wrong, Danny, but as programmatic strategies within the strictly digital sphere. So we're not going to be as good as digital media people in, in being able to, like in other words, if you're somebody that searched, you live in Topeka, Kansas, 
and you've been searching to buy a piano, right? And then a piano company wants to market you, they're going to be able to market you because people are, you know, they're able to follow that woman who's been searching on Google to buy a piano, right? So that's how the digital media world works. And influencer marketing, at least not right now, in the short term future, we're not going to be able to be as good at targeting a woman in Topeka, Kansas who wants to, to purchase a piano. But the upside is, particularly among Gen Zers and Millennials, this is a lot more powerful and a lot more effective than those digital ads. That's why so much money is coming in from the brands. So the, the technical accuracy is not as good with respect to being able to identify the audience to get you know, to Max. So you know, Max just you know, poked one hole in it, right? There's other holes too. It's, it's pretty good, but it's not as good as in, as in the digital media space. But it's a lot more powerful. Uh, and then, are there any particular challenges to, given your specific industry, right, working with influencers, right, people who are, to some extent, a, a lot of it, a lot of their popularity is being a social media profile. Um, so then, to what extent do you have difficulties working with influencers, get either in getting, you know, acquiring them, getting them to sort of agree to certain terms or conditions, or what is it like sort of working with influencers to a large extent? Catherine, do you want to answer that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> generally, the larger they are, the more difficult it is. Uh, influencers know how much power they have, or like how much leverage they hold over brands. So it depends on verticals, like yogis cost more, moms cost more, but um, some of them have started to get managers. I think that's a recent development in the last year or two. There are entire agencies that um, collect influencers <coughs> and, and trade them like baseball cards, but um, it's, I mean, the really, really great ones to work with are the, like, very micro ones under 50,000 because they know what they're worth and they come to you with great ideas and they're very willing to work with you to cooperate and deliver an authentic message. So, I know we've said that a million times, authentic, but um, they can craft a very compelling message in a way that an influencer with a million following um, no longer cares to do. That makes sense. Yeah, sure. Um, but negotiating prices—that's—I don't think as challenging as like getting them on, getting the influencers on the same page as the brand, and delivering the message that suits both the brand and the influencers. We want it to resonate with the consumers, and um, at the end of the day, like they're trying to target someone like me, I'm 24, and I want to look at an Instagram post that seems real, or like seems mm -hmm. like something I'd actually be interested in. Sure. I have a question. <coughs> brands that you're working with, are, do they have, are they asking for any creative, um, are they wanting to approve any of the creative or have their hands in any of the creative? Or yeah. are they trusting that like these influencers are vetted by you so they're on brand for them? So that's, a, that's a, another really, you guys ask some really great questions. So look, a lot of, look, our, our, we, I get up all the time and I say, I, influencers become a dirty word. I've even thought about changing our company to take the word influencer out of it, yeah. right? Because I think too much of it's associated with like the Kims and Kylie's and the Kendall's or general perceptions of, about, about influencers, right? And so the, the, the brands, the brands are cognizant of that too. Like we don't, we don't take on a project, but, Look, a lot of, there's so much I want to say on this, but a ton of tech platforms popped up about three years ago uh -huh. as all the money started moving into space and every tech entrepreneur thought, well, I'm going to create a Tinder for the influencer world. That's essentially what they are. And they match brands with influencers, right? And then the brands tell the influencers what to say. <clears throat> and you see those posts, I guarantee you've seen those posts on, on, on Instagram, and there's just zero authenticity in those things, right? Mm -hmm. And we shy away from that. We won't take on a project where the brand is going to want to dictate what the influencer says. Mm -hmm. But but generally, they at least early on, they're going to want to approve the post. So right. they're, they're going to want, they're going to give, the only kind of campaigns we do is where we give influencers full attitude to create the kind of messaging they want to create. Oftentimes, the influencers will look for guidance from us, mm -hmm. but we give them 100% complete latitude. And it's very, very rare, Captain, correct me if I'm wrong, it's very rare for the brands to come back and have an issue with it. Unless yeah. there's they understand. Sometimes it takes a little explaining, like, hey, this is the message that we think will resonate best with your audience. And um, So minimal brand uh, 
input with the influencers. Mm -hmm. okay. in, in the micro campaigns. In the micro, right. So if we're like doing, 50, a, if we're doing like a larger, 50, if we're doing a larger campaign for a big beauty company, and they want to big, use big beauty influencers, right? The the brand, the brand executives are going to feel like more of their careers are tied up with something potentially going wrong. Totally. They're going to want to prove something, particularly if it's a YouTube video or something done by a bigger influencer. But on the micro campaigns, which really is the future of influencer marketing, mm -hmm. the brands will, don't get too involved. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you you talked about you just talked about it again in terms of micro influencers being the future, uh, and I'm curious to know more about where you source the influencers from, um, especially at that level, because the big name ones I, I imagine would be easier to find. Um, but in terms of finding relevant influencers, and maybe it ties into the technology. Um, I assume it does, but can you talk yeah, more it about does. that? It, it's the, she, she, her group has developed this search engine that searches the entire universe for influencers. So, um, and then Catherine and her team will also just do, they'll sometimes resort to even just Googling, just kind of back it up. But Danny's team will produce, will produce kind of a, a list. Like we recently had a campaign where there was a big campaign. So it was a big, you know, very, you know, very lucrative campaign for us. And they wanted hundreds of influencers. And their target were pregnant millennial moms. So that was the target, right? So it's a very, very niche uh, target. And, and I want to say that's not your ideal influencer campaign because the typical influencer is going to have a wide variety of followers, right? It's generally not going to be 100% segmented within a certain even age or, or gender demographic. A lot of beauty influencers will be, a good influ beauty influencer will have 70, 80% female following. Right, the problem is that a lot of, you know, and you know, like we won't use a beauty influencer that comes what below what sixty capital, about roughly. Okay, all right. So you, you want to try to, but on this campaign I'm referring to right now, the target was pregnant millennial moms. So we had to find, you know, pregnant influencers around the world, uh, or you know, very new moms or influencers trying to get pregnant, and you don't always announce that on social media. So it's really hard to identify what people are trying. So that was the, you know, Catherine was one of the people, one of the people working on that campaign. So it sometimes can get really, really specific, and we kill it on this campaign. So part of it, when I presented to Clorox last week, uh, one of the slides was about the. This is one of our first case studies for the Clorox companies. This is a health and wellness company that's marketing a product to pregnant millennial moms, and we compared their internet traffic in the same period from a year ago. And it had it over doubled during these time periods. So the influencers were really successful in driving that traffic. And had the target been a little broader, like another another product that you know, another campaign we worked on recently within the Clorox company is a product called NeoCell. You heard of anybody heard of NeoCell? So it's collagen supplements. So you know, you take the collagen supplement and you look more beautiful, right? Who doesn't want to look more beautiful? Right? So that's got a broader demographic target, right? So they're, I think, going after, I think, what is it, Captain, 18 to 35 or something? Mm -hmm. But even then, but if it goes higher, it goes lower, they may still sell products too. So that's a much broader target. So, and those are generally going to better influence our campaigns because, it, it, because we're, you know, that anytime somebody posts, they're going to hit a broader group. But even on this example where we had a really narrow target of pregnant millennial moms, we still killed it. And the, it, the traffic numbers were really, really high. So we're trumpeting that throughout all these other Clorox companies right now. So we're really, really, really proud of that. So it is, you know, it is possible to get really specific. And in that case, it was tough. We used Danny's team to, to give us the list of everybody they thought was pregnant. You know, and, and again, it's not just the influencers that are pregnant. You want to you look at their followers. You want to make sure they have a large number of followers in that category of women that are trying to get pregnant or new moms, right? So that's where the te technology just helps infinitely. We couldn't have been as successful with that campaign two years ago without this technology that her team has built. So I think a lot of people, or I see some hands kind of popping up here and there, so here's what we'll do. I have a series of like three or four rapid fire questions, right. uh, and then we'll just open it up to Q&A. That works. Awesome, awesome. Right, cool. So um, if you had to give one piece of advice to either a new or early stage founder. Uh, keep your mind open. Right, just don't be too in love with whatever your current vision is. Keep your mind open, right? And just look for, just do what you do, do the, lot, the job that you love right now, and then just be open to where it can take you, what the possibilities are. Okay. 
any good, you, you said tipping point, but any other good books or podcasts or general information sources that you'd recommend? About entrepreneurship in general? No, just anything you like. Mm -hmm. Favorite book other than tipping point, maybe? Uh, mm. God, I was just, Catherine just asked me on the way over here, too. I was telling her, man, I've just not been reading enough. I've been so buried in what I'm doing. I don't know, like, can you give a good answer to that? I love Outliers and a book called You Only Need to Be Right One. Is that mine? The other one? Um, I forgot the name. I, I can look it up for okay. you. Ultimately, it's just a book on, that share all the story about how all the big startup began and what their journey into where they get to be <coughs> like Dropbox, you know, WhatsApp, and all these stories that every one of you probably would want to learn. Rob, you mentioned Blink Page, right? What's that? Blank page. You mentioned that earlier. Blank page? The website? Oh. I did? Yeah. What did I say? All <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay. Yeah, I'm generally, like, it, look, for me, for my, my book and film and TV choices, it's more about, I was just saying this to Gavin, I'm, I'm looking to be inspired and to grow, right? So I, I feel like, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I learn like within the business world every single day, mm -hmm. right? And, uh, you know, every single day I take notes, my own personal journal about what I learned that day and try to grow from that. But generally in terms of an outside entertainment, books and films, I'm just looking for something that's going to inspire me. Okay, there you go. Uh, what advice would you give to yourself at the start of your career or to students about to enter the workforce? Yeah. Uh, you know, outside of just entrepreneurship more generally maybe. Yeah, and I think, you know, kind of like I said when I, you know, I had that, that moment where, you know, I woke up one day and said, I'm going to be a sports agent, right? It's, I wasn't thinking big enough, so just think big. Like, just don't limit yourself. And just remember, guys, the, the world is going to be very different years from now, right? I mean, uh, you know, the, the industry that you're going to work in may not exist yet, right? Or maybe you invent it, right? So you just got to kind of keep your eyes open continuously, looking at the rise and understanding the developments that are happening. And you pick your right moment to jump in and start something brand new, right? I mean, I couldn't possibly predict it where I'd be today. The influencer space didn't exist until we invented it in 2010. Right? So just keep your keep your, your mind open, think big, don't close yourself off to possibilities. Okay. And then my last question: What is the best piece of advice you've ever received, and from him? Wow. Wow. Mm. That's a great question. I don't know if I got the answer to that. It's probably going to be. Uh, <coughs> even that thought, because it's such a great question. The best piece of advice I've ever had. Yeah, uh, it would have to be my father, right? I don't know going through all the different wisdoms, but I, I think, you know. Like I, even with a story that I shared with you earlier, which is you know, much more personal, is just I, the key to my success in life is again been that, that unconditional love that I knew I had from my family, right? It wasn't dependent on anything. I could have gone back and dropped down to law school and been a garbage man and they would have loved me. And so I, I think it's been, I don't know if that's really advice, but that's been the core of kind of who I am. And I try to share that with everybody. I'm, you know, I'm just throughout my, these guys, I just recently got married, uh, and, and most of the people in this room, um, not in this room, from my company came to, came to the wedding party. And they heard me go on <coughs> about everybody I loved in that room. And so I'm big on love, guys. I'm big on kind of expressing, I'm expressing uh, myself, and I want the people in my life to know the emotions and love that I feel. And so um, somewhere I think I got that from my family. So maybe that's the best advice I've ever gotten. Fantastic. All right. All right, with that, I'll get out of the way and open it up if anyone has questions. What's the worst advice you ever received? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> worst advice. I had that in and out of one ear. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't even have retained it. Can you think of anything? I'll blank out myself. Yeah, worst advice. Yeah, I don't know that would have resonated with me long enough to live. Sorry, I don't know if I can answer that. <laughs> that's good advice on its own. What's that? That's, yeah. that's good okay, advice great. on its own. In one year out. Yeah. You guys talked a lot about micro and moving even smaller than that. One thing that's also happening in the space is AI influencers. How has that kind of been part of your conversation? 
you mean by AI intelligence? He, she means actual AI yeah, so intelligence. Cool. I mean, he, he means actual, actual, they're not yeah. real people. Yeah. yeah. They're robotic. They've been growing a lot of followings. So <coughs> curious on your thoughts about that. Uh, you know, this is where, this is interesting. I gotta be honest with you. Uh, this is where the area that we are still trying to spend some our research more on really identifying and understanding that level of influence that is actually how we would really use and how it's really be able to translate to what our clients are looking for, to be honest. I mean, it's hard. Look, there's, there's not much authenticity there, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You've got to create it, right? I mean, let me ask you the question. How, how, you know, how, how persuaded would you be by a post by an AI influencer? I mean, I wouldn't personally be persuaded, but this could be a huge up, you know, potential for that, right? You, you have control over that influencer. You can control their content, you can control like, what they produce. Yeah, but all that really matters is that, that, that influencer's impact on the, uh, his or her audience, right? Mm -hmm. That's really what it ultimately comes down to. Like every vetting analysis we do is based on engagement and, and likes and comments, and you know, I was saying this before, but it, say a beauty influencer that we're considering has got a, a high engagement rate, but let's say she's also a horseback rider, and if you dig into it, you see her engagement goes way up for the horseback riding and not for the beauty post, right? So that's the kind of sophisticated you've got to get into, and you got to net all that out, and then you got to look, well, within beauty, how, what's her engagement like on hair as opposed to skin or makeup? Right, so the, the engagement analysis get really, it's all about authenticity and what's really persuading the, uh, you know, what's really persuading the audience. So it's hard for me to imagine an AI influencer really, you know, maybe I'm wrong, maybe that day will come, but I, I wouldn't be looking for us to use them anytime soon. Yeah, we would be looking to eliminate them in general for now, yeah. because that's not real, that's not authentic, that's not, you know, that's, that's the whole technology that we try to focus on. You know, unless somehow, unless somebody was successful, in creating an AI influencer that represented the persona of a lot of people. So if, for example, that AI influencer rep, you know, really represented the voice of the followers or a large portion of those followers, if that, if that could somehow be proven out, <coughs> then, then maybe it becomes phenomenal, right? Then you've got one influencer representing you know, hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands or millions of people. But it would have to, that AI created influencer would have to represent a much larger following. So I've actually been asked this question a lot with, with my clients, and and just to piggyback off that, so the, the three biggest traits that millennials value are authenticity, transparency, and creativity. So if the AI campaign is done in such a way where it's super transparent that it is an AI, and it's a very creative campaign around a mascara or whatever it might be, that might tap in to the millennial mindset, right? Mm -hmm. But if it's the AIs that are like pretending that they're people, like we've all seen those like on YouTube or articles that have come out about that, where like they think it's the real person, like those crash and burn fast because then you guys are like, oh, moving on, it's just like when the Kardashians post their gummy bear ads that you know that they're not really eating. So to kind of go off of that, if it's transparent and if it's super creative, those are the ones that are doing right. well. Yep, yep. Uh, I'm not a fan of that and, and either. And to use but that example, right? If, it, right? if it's about mascara, if all of the, if the people are chiming in, so if the target audience, those target women, are all chiming in about the mascara, and they're all posting comments about the mascara, and then, it's become, then it's become something beyond that robotic. Right, it's almost like the cartoon. Yeah. Is. So yeah. it's, it, yeah. Exactly. Um, so when you're talking to brands and and trying to have them pay you guys, obviously, to do a influencer campaign. What's your selling point for using you guys over competitors like Full Screen or Studio Seventy One that represent a lot of the top tier talent? Yeah, in the digital influencer. It's hard, man. And it, it was hard back when I was a sports agent because everybody's got speed. Everybody's, you know, I'm better than the next guy. So it it, it really is hard. So ultimately, it's just going to come off relationships and. and you know, our track record has always been around authenticity. Like I said, we're the only influencer marketing company in the world that integrates influencers into things like trend setting and product ideation and product testing. We're not just there to collect your money for on a marketing campaign. So we really believe in it. The influencers we pick, you know, we've built this whole technology around making sure we're picking the influencers that actually are impacting trends. So, but it's a, it's a hard sales pitch. Because you're right, every other company is coming with why they're the best, and it's a very it's it's a there's a ton of influencer companies out there, 
You know, there's nobody really leading it. There's nobody killing it. You know, there's like, I don't know, probably 10 of us that are on a short list of brands are going out on influencer campaigns. But that, that presents, presents an extraordinary opportunity, right? So as a lot of these, a lot of these are falling off. Like I said, those tech platforms, which I, I like to think of are kind of like Tinder, and those things are just falling off. So there's being a weeding out. And like I said before, there's a lot of horrible influencers too. So those influencers are getting weeded out, and a lot of the influencer companies are getting weeded out. The people, they just dove into it just because they developed the technology, but they don't really understand the space. And what do you say to the kind of the old school marketing CMOs when you're uh, valuing a 10,000 follower Instagrammer and they're going, well, why are we paying them this much money? Shouldn't we be putting that to someone that has, you know, 500K plus? Like, because we, we know that their value can be more uh, just because, like Jenna said, it's intuitive and all of that. But what do you say to that kind of old school mentality? Well, remember, the, the choice is that, that one influencer with 500,000 followers versus a lot of the people, the, of the women with 10,000 followers, right? Right. So the choice is a smaller number of larger influencers versus a larger number of smaller influencers. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah. And what, what we as a company believe in, we are strident believers in the fact given that choice, you're always going to take a larger number of smaller influencers. Right. And we actually, like a, a case study that I don't see up there, um, but yeah. another one that I, Kaplan worked on for a little bit is that it's a Neutrogena campaign we just did. And they wanted, um, they wanted some big influencers, so we did some macro influencers that had millions of followers, and then we did a, a, a other campaigns for the same product, uh, so within the campaign, for a larger number of smaller micro influencers. And by every metric, so like when you get into the, I hope I'm not speaking Chinese to you guys, but like you know, cost per engagement or cost per impression, when you start looking at those kinds of metrics, it was way, way higher on the smaller influencers being mm -hmm. aggregated together. So like with the, the dichotomy that you created, if you gave me the choice between a 500 and the same price, I'm always going to take the, the person with the 500,000 followers right. over the one with 10,000. But that's not how the world works, right? right? For that same price that it would cost to get the woman with 500,000, I can get quite a few of them with 10,000. Right. And those 10, you know, and those 10,000, uh, you know, I'm going to make up a number right now. I'm going to say six or seven of them mm -hmm. will outperform one with 500,000. Mm -hmm. So in other words, aggregately, we're only reaching 60, 70,000, right? Mm -hmm. You guys follow me in the back, six or seven to have 10,000 followers. So aggregately, we're only reaching 60, 70,000, but that's still going to outperform. We're going to sell more products whoever we're selling. Those six or seven will sell more. Because they're seen as more authentic by their followers, they have more direct relationship with their followers, right? They're not seen as the higher guns as much as that that woman with the five hundred thousand followers. Mm -hmm. In starting your own company, um, what skills do you think you took from your corporate experience with you, and are you thankful for your corporate experience? Yeah, I am. I, I think my cor yeah, I think my corporate experience, my, my law background, right? So. Yeah, look, at any of you who think about law school, I wouldn't, no, I probably wouldn't dissuade you from it. I, I'm a big believer in business school, right? I think MBAs, the great thing about an MBA is, is it, 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 it's, it's, it's built around versatility, and you can do a zillion things with an MBA degree, right? Um, and law school, so in law school, look, I'm grateful for my law background and those, those early years I had at Latham and Watkins and then, and then going to the sports agency around. Um, so it, uh, you just always got to take whatever you learn from that. But yeah, it, you know, in those early days, I think what I learned, what I care about the most, and it's still at the top of my hiring criteria. Again, I was just saying, Captain drove me here, so I was just saying on the ride over to Captain. Um, what I what I value the most in, in hiring, right, is attention to detail and work ethic. All right, those two things. And what's more, most significant about that is what's not on the list, because I'd also love, you know, crazy intelligence and crazy creativity. Right? But I'll sacrifice those latter two just to get the attention to detail and work ethic. And I think that's what I learned from my early, early corporate days, particularly law firm, right? Being a law review back at law school, I learned about every comma and apostrophe that I had to place. And, and so I've always been driven by, by that. And our hiring, I think, has reflected that. And I think that's been a differentiator for us to answer, uh, to answer his question about us. I think we've, we've got a, a team full of people that bring that kind of attention to detail to these campaigns. I can actually echo that too. Um, I graduated from SC in 2006, and I went off and worked for Accenture. 
Um, and I think the experience there, and then after that I had my own company and then I started working for a FinTech company and then ended up with uh, Zomat right now. Um, I think the <coughs> results that you're gonna get as well is very, also can be very helpful. Um, the big company or any kind of consulting or any even investment bank or any company like that corporate side um, that give you the exposure of seeing how a business is being run um, and giving your access to learning from other senior at those companies, that is also a very valuable skill to have to prepare you for your entrepreneurship journey. Um, I, and also, you know, and also financially, wise. you got some, you know, you can save up and start it building up um, your contact network and your financial to get jump start first. And then also you need to find the right founders, cold founders that you've got to be working with, right? Um, if you are all in startup, you always going to hear from all the successful startup out there and the investor themselves is a team. It's not so much about the horse, it's the jockey, right? So that, in a way, the corporate world can really help you with that as well. So thinking beyond just you know gaining the resource from them or the skill where you have to work really hard. I actually think working really hard is come within you though. So within each individual one of you, whether you have the work ethic or not, whether you have you know ambitions, whether you really <coughs> want to work hard for something you believe in, uh, that has to come within each of you. But I'm sure you all have it when you're sitting here with us. And, you know, mm -hmm. right now I'm trying to listen and learn from us, so. So, um, you talked earlier about the failures leading up to your sports agent job. Yeah. Um, was that like a make or break moment for you? How did you deal with that pressure? Yeah, man, that was, no, that was, a, that was such a self-doubt period. You know, because I felt like I, you know, I was, you know, top of my class in college, at super cool loud A, and law review in the University of Chicago, and then, like I said, I got, I, I, I got sold out. I sold out in the law firm just because you get to think you're this huge deal because they're throwing so much money at you and whining about you. But yeah, that was a hard period. When I went through that period where I quit my job and put out notice, sure that I find another business job, and I couldn't find one. I couldn't. I really couldn't. So it's one of those moments that we all have them. Like, what have I done? And believe me, I've had plenty of moments, even as an entrepreneur, where I thought I bit off way more than I could chew. You know. It's been a few years since I've had those moments, but in that, that period in between Xeni and Zomad, that was a tough period for me too, right? I had, you know, Xeni, you know, seemed like the world to be this extraordinary success, and I already shared with you numbers, we grossed like seven million, but it was still, it wasn't, it wasn't, it was never gonna be anything that big. And then, you know, and I had this vision for Zomad, but it's tough starting a company, right? In those two years, it was tough, and I, you know, uh, I was sapped with resources, so it was, you know, that was a, you know, those, those you know, it's so cliche to, to hear, right, but you really do become so much stronger. You're successful because of, not in spite of, but because of those, 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 those frustrating, fearful moments, you know, and so, you know, but you just got to dig deep, you know, like I did, you know, thankfully, way back in that day, I dug deep, and you know, when I had a lot of self-doubt because I couldn't land one of these business jobs and I thought I just ruined the trajectory of my entire life by quitting this top law firm and I had no other job. And one day I just, I thought big. And once I had that vision, nothing could get me off it. And I was, and when I started on that, right, I didn't know anybody in sports. I really didn't. I didn't have any friends who were coaches or players or, that, I, that I really knew of. But when I just started attacking it and, you know, that I managed to, to find the right person that gave me a 20 minute informational interview. So, yeah. But throughout my career, you've always got those moments. Those, and you grow from them. And it sounds so cliche, you know, you never, you never want those bad periods to come. But when they, when they do, invariably, you'll see, you'll see years later that you grow so much because of them. I, well, if you want to call people, go ahead. Oh, I'm yeah, yeah. there. Go ahead. Go ahead. So going from Xeni to Zomad, <coughs> what lessons did you take from being a CEO in the first company to now with Zomad? In terms of managing people and so I, 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 um, so each one's different. So my first time as a CEO was really back in the champion days when I spun off that company. It was, that was my first kind of foray into the entrepreneurial world. Um, and that was easy. That was a great one to start out at because I had this big, huge name behind me, champion. 
right? Right? And so it wasn't really purely entrepreneurial. Right? And I was a lawyer by background, and I was basically traveling the world cutting up licensing and distributorship deals around the world. So, and that, that's what I'm saying. If you see an opportunity, whatever work path you go down, opportunities will arise. You just got constantly got to stay alert and look out for them. Um, but each time I've learned, you know, I think maybe one of the big lessons I learned back then was about just hiring the right people. It's all around the people about you, around you. You know, right now, you know, I've said this, you know, about us. I, the great thing about Zomag right now is, I just started saying this a few months ago, but for the first time ever, it doesn't need me, right? She runs one half of the company, and then we got another half of the company run by Catherine's boss. And, you know, I could go off to Tahiti for two months, <laughs> come back, and I'm confident the company would be doing really well. <coughs> right? So I think, you know, one of the primary lessons I've learned along the way, I don't think I did that as well, by the way, in the Xeni days, but it's making sure you're surrounding yourself with the right kind of talent. But you got to treat them well, you got to pay them enough, you've got to, you know, so there's a lot that goes into that. And you learn, you learn along the way. And then, sorry, can I just follow up? Sure. Yeah. So this is such a new type of industry. How did you go about finding the people with experience or expertise that you thought was valuable? I, I don't want people that, like, like mm -hmm. Kaplan was a finance major. I don't care about experience. I really don't, right? I don't care. Like, I, you know, the, the, I just want, again, I want the smartest people I can find who have a really strong work ethic and tremendous attention to detail. I don't care what industry you're coming from, <coughs> right? In our field, it helps if you're creative. Like, the great thing about hiring young, we love to hire young, right? Because we're social media and influencers, and you all, everybody in this room grew up with it, right? So, um, but yeah, I'm not as concerned. So. And, and that's, a, that's a good question. That's a question on which I diverge from. You're going to have a lot of other speakers come here. I just learned today I'm the first of your speakers, right? So I'm honored to be the first of your speakers. But you're going to have a lot of come through and disagree on some of these points. But that's a point on which many will disagree. Well, I just happen to be in a camp right now where I don't value uh, experience as much as I do those, those right kind of qualities. If you have those qualities, we can teach you to be a superstar. Like, like I said, Catherine was a finance major here at SC. I just graduated six months ago. She didn't know the first thing about marketing, or let alone influencer marketing. But she's learning it now. And it won't be long before she can manage these big campaigns. Lana. So we talked a lot about um, female influencers and consumers. I'm just wondering, is there a market for male consumers? And or is that a hole in the market that you could potentially? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Well, we've been talking to you. You're right. We were talking a lot about beauty. Yeah. But no. Yeah. It's um, so look, most influencers are female, yeah. um, and you know, like we've done, we've got like one of our clients is Axe, right? And, and um, you know, I say this. I said this at the Clorox conference last week. A lot of times, people want to find influencers that represent their target market, not with Axe. If your target is a 24 year old male, you're you got a way better chance of reaching them through a 24-year-old female, right? <laughs> so it, it just, it's just, it's really, so you, it's not all about just matching, but matching the, yeah. the, the influencer with the audience. Um, but yeah, men are a huge target. It just depends upon the campaign. So we've got some projects. I mean, when we, the, you know, so our, when we launched in 2010, our first client was BlackBerry. If you guys remember even BlackBerry, what that is, right? Um, and then our second client was Nivea for Men. Um, and then from Nivea for Men, and they spent a million and a half dollars with us back when nobody was spending that kind of money. And that guy today is now the CMO of Clorox, hence the, so these mm -hmm. people traveling around, right? And he was a pioneer. I mean, he trusted us, so I give him all the credit in the world. His name is Magnus Johnson. I'll celebrate him to you guys as well. But, you know, he, because he saw back in 2011, you know, when all these stodgy CMOs, nobody's really seen the value of these influencer strategies. Right? He saw the value. He signed on and he gave us most of his budget and he saw his sales forecast be beat on just an influencer spend. It was crazy what he did. Even today, that would be pretty radical what he did, but it, it, it worked. Right? But to answer your question, Lana, that was all around reaching men. And we used women to reach men. <coughs> right? So all the women were posting about, you know, yeah. about the product and that was far more effective. Um, you talked about how there's like multiple other companies who are like kind of doing like something similar as you. What do you have a plan of action like towards the future, like how to differentiate, like how to level up, and like you be the sole one that's like succeeding? In that? Yeah, that's a, another great question. Do you want to answer that one? 
She wants. She wants to buy them. Yeah, eventually. Yeah. Eventually. Um, you know, there's there are a couple of things. I think from what my experience working with the company so far, I'm no nowhere in the background of influencer marketing or anything like that. I'm completely data technology, AI, and stuff like that. Um, I've definitely seen that for us in particular, the company has been doing very well in terms of be one step ahead of every all the competition, right? <coughs> one of the products that conference that we did last week, we have other company that was there that do pretty much similar. There's an overlap in working with influencers and stuff like that. Um, none of them will actually really show the capability and the, the point of view in which that influencer can really deliver value for that whole value chain of the product, from product ideation all the way to the branding and marketing and promotions, right? Um, and there's, we always trying to be one step ahead of all of our competitors out there. That's for us one way of differentiating. Um, he sees the, uh, the future is all really putting in with big machines that really helping us stay ahead of the game. Um, that's, was, that's why actually the whole of our team come into place where he sees this is where the industry is going to go. Um, so I would say a short term. For us, it's really about doing really well at what we're currently doing and keep ourselves ahead of the game. Um, in the future, yes, we are, this is part of the thing that he and I have, and you know, our management team has been trying to looking at. This is a very highly fragmented, like it's too fragmented. And if you all learn here in industry at a certain point, it's time for consolidation. I strongly believe that that is where this influencer marketing is gonna get its own where companies, couple companies, I mean, it's a smaller one who can't really keep up, you know, gonna be falling off, and then there's a number of them gonna start gathering together and be gonna dominate in this industry, right? And you, and you constantly have to innovate. Yeah, right? so that's innovation really, is really well, If you're talking to them, right, if we get a half hour introduction to a CMO, right, out, then you better, you better make things, to, to say things to make them think twice. Like, for example, I had this idea a long time ago I was wondering about, I was wondering, I'd ask Danny, this is about a year ago, right? I'd ask her the question, if we, what, if, what if we did studies to see, if we do an influencer campaign, and say we have 100 influencers, right? And so we're reaching uh, 50 million consumers, just I'm picking a, a random number. And I wonder about how many of those, of those consumers saw that post more than once? In other words, what was the overlap among those influencers? Does that make sense? So to try to study the audience and see their overlap. And, um, and so, you know, and then Danny went off and created a product that did it. Nobody else in the industry has done that. So, you know, we just came up with the first pilot program we've shared with some of the clients. But it's about, in other, so in other words, if we do a campaign with a certain number of impressions, we can tell you that 15 or 18 percent of them saw that post at least once. And then, you know, 8 percent saw it four times. And we, the reason why that's relevant throughout marketing, for any of you taking any of your marketing classes, there's all kinds of different theories on how many times uh, a consumer has to see something before they act, but generally you got to hit consumers over the head multiple times. You know they used to they used to say seven. I think now they're saying oh, three to five. Or whatever, whatever they're teaching your, yeah. in your influencer class in, in your marketing classes. But so we innovated and we created an analysis that does that. We can break down a campaign to show you how many times influencers saw that. So constantly innovating. Jen. So for certain <coughs> campaigns, then do you target influencers who? Have the same followers, like um, so, like an overlap. Yeah, if, if yeah, they have, if so they have we're we're brand new with this analysis. Oh. So what we're seeing right now is about kind of fifteen to eighteen percent, right? So you can have, you know, so in other words, if you have an influencer or two influencers, is that right? Am I saying that right? Two influencers, then if they each have the same number of followers, roughly fifteen to eighteen percent of those will will have will be following both. Now it's going to be higher in beauty. If beauty or you know, if something like beauty where people are going to follow multiple beauty influencers, then it may be an automotive or health and wellness or tech or gaming or, or lifestyle and these others. But we're still in a very, very early stage of trying to figure of trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. But as far as we know, we're the only influencer company in the world doing that kind of analysis. Which is great. So you constantly innovate and that's what the whole technology backbone allows us to do. Thank you all for coming. Yeah, Max, thank you.